Good morning. My name is Matt Portman. I'm one of the student pastors over at St. Charles campus. I've been here a time before, so you might remember me. If not, feel free to come up and shake my hand. I'd love to love to meet you, talk to you, and get to know a little bit about you. I know Gustavo is not here. He will be back next week, correct? Cool. His wife is shaking, shaking her head. So I'm assuming that's right. So I'm not Gustavo. My name is Matt. Pleasure to be here. Uh, we are, we're starting a new series, and so uh, I, I want to start off with this. I'm going to ask you a question. Feel free to raise your hand. That's allowed here. I don't know if it normally is, but for Sunday, today, it is allowed. So raise your hand if you are the type of person who loves to make lists. Anyone in here just like, I have to make a list no matter what. Like, the, I, no matter, I, if I don't make a list, nothing is going to get done. Raise your hand for that. I see some husbands kind of nudging their wife, like, yeah. And so I, I am not a list person, not a list person at all, but I'm married to a list person. And so there, there's, not many, there's not many Saturdays that I don't wake up, and I go look at this whiteboard calendar that we have in our, in our kitchen, and, and there's, like, things to do on there. There's, like, do laundry, clean the kids', kids bedrooms, do this, uh, you know, do that, all, this, all these different lists, go shopping, buy groceries, that stuff, like, List after list after list. Now, I'm not the type of person who likes to make lists. I only have one thing against lists, though. Just one thing. It's that you never put anything fun on the list, right? You never have to put, like, go to the game or go see a movie or, or go skating. Any, anything that would be fun, any possible thing, go hang out with friends, game night. That stuff is never makes it on the list. It's only chores. Clean the room, clean the bathroom, do this, do that. That's the worst part about it. You never have to do the fun thing. And so, listen, if you are a list person, I have nothing against you. Us non-list people, we thrive because of you. So, so reach over to your list person and give them a pat on the back and say, you know, I love you, even though sometimes you drive me crazy. Um, no, I, I, I'm kid, I kid about that. Uh, we are going through a series called Christmas List. We are starting it, actually, today. And the thing about Christmas is, this is a time where we make more lists than usual, right? There's tons of lists that involve in Christmas. There's a uh, to-do list. There's a naughty and nice list. You might have already received uh, a Christmas wish list from your children or from your grandkids. Um, you have the, uh, the shopping list or what we do in my family. We make a list of, of all the people we have to buy for. Do you guys have that list? Or you check them off. Okay, I got, I got grandma done. I got, I got my niece done. So, you know, we have all these lists that we have for Christmas, and during this series, we're going to talk about a different list each week, and we're going to start with today's talking about the Christmas to-do list. That's our idea today, the to-do list for Christmas, which is very, very long, a lot of stuff that we have to do for Christmas, uh, and our Christmas story, as you guys are familiar with, you might be, you think about all the details you're, you're putting together in your memory as we're getting back to the Christmas season, so here we go, we have Mary, we got Joseph, we got this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and a manger. We have shepherds, we have magi, we have angels, we have all these different things in the Christmas story that we remember, that we see in our nativity set. But all those ideas, they kind of come from two different stories. They come from Luke, and they come from Matthew. Those are the only two gospel writers that give us any clue to the details of Jesus' birth. John's not really interested in talking about it, and Mark, he's not interested either. Just Luke and Matthew. So what we know of our Christmas story is actually a combination of two stories from two authors who wrote it together. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of jump back and forth between the two. If you wouldn't mind, we're going to start in Luke, and then we're going to end in Matthew, all right? So 
Let's start in Luke, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. All right, here we go. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. If you have your Bibles, you can read along. If not, you can read on the screen. Here we go. In those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This is the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went out to be registered, each to his town, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was there, who was with child. And while they were there, a time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. You're probably familiar with that story. We hear it read during the Christmas Eve services, right? Typically, that's what it happened. Right after, or right before you light the candle, you might hear this read and sing Silent Night. We're familiar with that story. The first thing that you read is that there's a census going on at that time. So they're counting everybody, figuring out the whole Roman world, the way those would work, it's not everywhere in the Roman world taking place. It would take place in different little pockets. So we know for sure that at the region of Judea, it was the time for them to have the census. And what that meant is that everyone was coming in, the people who had left Judea, the people who left Jerusalem, who left Bethlehem, they'd be coming back in. So cousin, aunt, grandma, people you haven't seen in a long time, they would all be traveling back home for that season. And so... What I can tell you a little bit is this town that Jesus was born in was Bethlehem, right? And, and maybe we don't know a little bit about it, but Bethlehem was a very insignificant city. Even though it has um, a, a hometown hero that all of Israel could champion, right? David was born in Bethlehem. It's David's hometown. Maybe at one point it was very significant, but at the time of Jesus, Bethlehem was pretty insignificant. It was a small town. A few hundred people, not many things going on. There's not like a a nice mall or anything. There's nothing like that. There's not a big movie theater, probably not even really hotels or anything. Just a small, little, quaint town. But the census has brought a lot of people back in, right? So think about that small town and how big news this would have been. Everyone's coming back in. This small town of just a few hundred would grow and would swell up to probably a few thousand because everyone is coming back in. This quaint little small town, which was once dead, and, and you can be honest, you've, you've been to a town that has been dead, it felt like there's no life, nothing going on, nothing to do, that was Bethlehem. But now with this, with this city, with this census going on, rather, there's activity. The, the streets are active again. The markets are going. Uh, people who, who used to sell things who were thinking, I'm not for sure if I can get by this season. I'm not for sure if our business is going to make it. All of a sudden, with all these people, this new activity, they're selling and things are going good and things are more fruitful and promising and profitable more than it's been in years. It's big news in a small town. But don't just think about the few thousand people who had come to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is only six miles away from one of the largest cities in the Roman world named Jerusalem. You've probably heard of that name too. Jerusalem had a, was a population of about 80,000 people. So imagine even tens of thousands of more people traveling through Bethlehem to get to Jerusalem. So, or sorry, through Bethlehem, yeah, to get to Jerusalem. So the city, Bethlehem, has so, so many people in it. And we see that it's so busy... So full, so packed, so much activity, there wasn't much space for Jesus, right? Mary and Joseph, they had the, they're, they're well off with child. They're, they're trying to give birth. They're trying to, to, to find a spot for this baby, baby to be born, but there's no room for them. There's no guest room available, so he has to be born in a manger and in a place where, where animals would normally feed, animals would normally eat. You see, the activity going on, the to-do list, the business that was going on made it where Bethlehem didn't have room for Jesus. Um, now, I come from a, a small town uh, in, in Illinois. It's called West Frankfurt. And I can actually say that it's, um, 
It's smaller than Troy. See, you guys in Troy, you have two exits off the highway. West Frankfort, we only have one exit. So it's about, only about 8,000 people. It's a very small town. And, and it doesn't take much in a small town for there to be big news, right? It could be something that in a normal town would be super insignificant, but it would be big news. So, for example, I can remember years ago, my small town got a second Casey's gas station. And let me tell you that that was huge news. There was a Casey's gas station all the way on the east side of town. It had been around for a while. But then, all of a sudden, for some reason, they decided that they're going to put a Casey's gas station on the west side of town. And let me tell you, that was the talk of the town for a couple weeks. Literally, people were like, hey, have you been to the new Casey's? Don't go to the east side, Casey's. That's, that's garbage. You don't want to go there. You want to go to the west side. The, the, this experience at the new one, the pizza is better, the taco pizza there is way better. The, the, the customer service is way better. Like It was the talk of the town for something so insignificant like a second Casey's in a town. It, it was big news. So think about that in the story of Bethlehem, this town of a few hundred, when everybody's coming in. There's so much going on. There's the hustle and bustle. The sense is it's so, so exciting. They get caught up in it. And they miss out on Jesus. See, Bethlehem, during that first Christmas, they were busy thriving with business. And, and maybe you, during this Christmas season, we can get busy too. We can get busy thriving, right? Because some of us, if we're honest, this is our favorite time of the year, right? We love Christmas. I know my mother is one of those people who puts up her Christmas tree like in October right when, Thanksgiving, or right when uh, Halloween is over. It's like she loves Christmas. And some of us, we love this time of season. We love, the, we love all the activity. And our to-do list is so, 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 so long. I wonder if sometimes we miss out on what we're really supposed to be doing, what Christmas really means. Think about all the things on that Christmas to-do list. We have to put up the lights, right? We have to put up the tree. We have to go shopping. We have, uh, we have family uh, Christmas parties. We have office Christmas parties. We have kids' recitals and dances and things we have to go to. We have to volunteer at church. Maybe we're working overtime so we have enough money to, to spend on extra gifts. They're so many things to do. The list goes on and on and on. Not to mention that we have to try to create this picture perfect Christmas so that everyone is satisfied, so that the kids are happy, so that when family comes into town, comes to your house, it's all great. You might have a project at your house that you're saying, I have to do this before all the family comes in, because I know when family comes in, I don't want them to see this thing. It has to be fixed. Man, our to-do lists are so, so long. And even though we love this season, the temptation is to just keep on writing things. Yes, they got to put this on the to-do list, add another thing, add another thing, add another thing, until our Christmas list really drags us down and fills our hearts where we really have no room for Jesus. Because the truth is, we only have so much time. I believe it's only uh, 21 days till Christmas. Is that correct? Anyone know that? Anyone counting down? 21. Kids are, yeah, 21. Is that correct? 21 days, I think, is, is, um, is only 21 days. So you can only fit so much into those 21 days. But the reality is our to-do list is probably something that would take more like 48 days, right? And probably something that would, we would try to squeeze in 50 days into 21 days. But when we do that, we make no room for Jesus to come in and, and do something special. Let's flip over to Matthew and let's read some of the details that Matthew shares with us. So we know Bethlehem was busy thriving. Let's see what some other people were doing during that first Christmas. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him. Skipping down a little further to verse 7, it says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring word to me that I may go worship him too. This might seem like a good thing. Herod has good intentions, but let me tell you, Herod does not. If you're familiar with the Christmas story, you realize that uh, just a few verses later, he's going to commit like... A, 
big atrocity and kill a lot of babies just to try to eliminate this threat. So he's scheming and planning uh, on this first Christmas to try to get rid of Jesus because Jesus is a threat to him. Let me tell you a little bit about, about who, who Herod is. Herod is, is the king of the Jews. At one time, he was very, very popular. Um, he, he rebuilt the temple. He married a, a Jewish wife. He, he was doing everything right, and then all of a sudden, his behavior becomes kind of erratic and crazy. So uh, he kills his wife. He marries 10 other women. And although he rebuilt the temple, which everybody was proud of, then he starts putting up other temples and worship spaces for other foreign gods. So you can imagine that the people of Israel, the people of Judea specifically, are pretty tired of Herod. They're, they're pretty tired of this, of this leader who's leading the, the nation in the wrong way. And they're sick and tired of him. And when Herod knows this, he knows that his influence once was high, his popularity once was high, but now it's at an all-time low. And then these mysterious men come to him and say, hey, we hear there's been a new king of the Jews born? King of the Jews in, in Bethlehem? Ooh, that's a major threat to him. See, on that first Christmas, Herod was busy trying to survive. His goal, his mission, he was obsessed with, I will do whatever I can to eliminate this threat to my kingdom. You've got to understand that Herod is the king of the Jews, but not through the line of David, not through the royal line of David, through a different line. But when these magi come and they say, oh, there's a king of the Jews that's been born in Bethlehem, the house of David. Also, he's through the line of David, the royal, holy, celebrated line of David, the best king in all of Israel. He's saying, oh, we can't let anybody know about this. We need to snuff this out, not tell anybody. So, so yeah, wise men, go find him, but then go tell me. So I'll go worship him. When really what he wants to do is he wants to kill him. See, during that first Christmas, Herod was busy trying to survive. And now I know no one in this room is trying to survive like Herod was, right? We're not, we're not trying to, like, hold our kingdom and, like, make sure that no one is a threat to us. Like, that's not what we're doing. But if we're honest, probably some of us have spent Christmases where we're saying, this year I'm just trying to survive, right? I'm just trying to survive, just trying to survive the holidays, just trying to make it through I had a Christmas like that uh, a couple years back. Um, it's actually in 2019. I remember it was like 10 days before Christmas. I get a call from a, from a buddy of mine that said, he said, hey, Matt, um, I got some bad news. Uh, he literally said, are you sitting down right now? If, you, if not, you should sit down. And I'm like, okay. Um, and he says, hey, um, sorry, I got to tell you this, but, um, but Pastor Tim, um, he just passed away. Um, Tim was a friend of mine. I worked with him for five years. One of my very best friends. He was a children's minister. He passed away tragically at early age in his mid-50s a couple years back. But 10 days before Christmas, I got that news. And me and my family, we, we came back home and spent, spent some time with friends. And, and all the activity of Christmas was still going on, right? The, the celebrations, the parties, the presents, all that stuff, it was still going on. But, but there was this, this dark cloud that kind of hovered over the holidays for us. That the joy was missing. It was just filled with, with grieving. It was a Christmas that me, my friends, my family, we were just trying to survive. And maybe you've been there before, maybe you're there this year. I'm not for sure how your year has gone, but maybe you've lost someone. Maybe there's been difficulties in finances. Maybe, maybe there's some type of division or conflict in your family that you're saying, I just need to survive this Christmas. I, I don't, I'm not all excited. I'm not, I'm not thriving this Christmas. I'm just trying to survive. And so we'll hunker down and we'll do whatever we can to protect ourselves and just try to survive. And the fear in that is that if we're just trying to hunker down, protect ourselves, trying to survive, is that we're missing out on the joy, on the comfort, and specifically on the healing that Jesus can offer you right now in this season. Because what we say is, say, if I can just survive, I, you know what I try to survive on? I try to survive on my own efforts, on my own power. Don't talk to me. Leave me alone. Let's just make it through. And I can do it myself. But that's not what Jesus wants you to do this season. It's not about you doing it on yourself with your power. It's about you relying on his strength. And you relying and leaning and, and drawing near to him. 
And we get in that survival mode, we say, I will fight or flight, I will do it all on my, by myself. All on my own. This Christmas, don't try to survive. Because when you do that, you're not leaving any room, you're going to miss out on what Jesus is trying to do with you this season. Three little further, we know that Bethlehem was busy thriving, we know Herod was busy surviving that first Christmas. Let's read about what the Magi were doing. Starting in verse 9, still in Matthew chapter 2. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, its mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These mysterious men, these, these magi, they, they're, they're busy trying to find Jesus while everyone else is busy with other stuff. And now, a lot of people have written plenty of things about who these magi are. And there's lots of scholars who have debated what they are, what their backstory is. And honestly, no one really knows. I, I can tell you a lot about Bethlehem. I can tell you population. I can tell you a lot about who Herod was. But these magi, I can't really tell you anything about them except for two things. One is that they probably had some sort of knowledge of the Hebrew Scriptures. They probably knew something about the Hebrew Scriptures because they understood that, that God was going to send a Messiah, a new king of the Jews, and they were looking for him. So they, they understood that that was a prophecy and that was going to happen. The other thing is that they probably came from hundreds of miles away. But think about how significant that is. Remember, Bethlehem and Jerusalem, Jerusalem just being six miles from Bethlehem, they don't see, they don't recognize that God has done something. But these men from hundreds of miles of way have was able to recognize that God has intervened in the time of history, realize that God was up to something absolutely span spectacular. So they're busy that first Christmas finding Jesus. And the thing is, is that I think some of us have done this song and dance of Christmas for a long time. We know the ebbs and flows. We know our part. We know what we're supposed to do. We know that, all right, for Christmas, I'm, I'm, I'm the ice person. Anyone, anyone in here just the person who grabs the ice for Christmas dinners? Anyone in that? Sometimes that was me. You just, you know, you know your role. You know, you know what Christmas is going to be about, right? You've done it so long, and you know the whole thing. And I think sometimes we get so close, so close to Christmas, we kind of just go through the motions, right? We don't step back. And realize that even though it's a season that we go through every year, even though I've had 30 Christmases in the church before and, and I've celebrated this thing time and time and time and time again, that Jesus might have something new for me this season. I mean, and just think about how significant it is for the church is that this is a specific time each year that's built in that we think about and we contemplate the incarnation of, of God, right? We, we contemplate God becoming flesh. God coming down from heaven, intervening in our story. The, the, the nature of Christmas, the story of Christmas is this, is that God sees us in our pain, and he's willing to break through and show up in our lives. If you've ever wondered that, is God seeing me? Does he care enough to show up? The story of Christmas is a reminder that, yes, he sees you, and, yes, he is willing to show up. Because the Israelites thought, God, one day will send someone. One day God will send a Messiah. But they could not even dream. They didn't even have a, a, an inkling in their mind that God one day would send himself. That God literally one day would come down and be wrapped in flesh to visit them, to bring hope and peace to their situation. They were looking for good news that God would send someone, but they got great news that God came down himself. And this Christmas season, if we miss it, we miss that moment that the whole church, not just this body, not just Harvester Christian Church, but Christians all over the globe are contemplating and, and, and wondering and worshiping Jesus based on the fact that he became flesh. The whole church focused on one thing for just a few weeks. It's a special 
special thing. Don't get caught up in the song and dance because we're so close because we've done it time and time again. Take a few things off that Christmas list. Take a few things off that to-do list. And take time to contemplate the incarnation, God becoming flesh. Because, you see, Bethlehem was busy thriving. Herod was busy surviving. The Magi were busy finding Jesus. And if we look for him to move, if we look for him to show up this situation and this season, he will. The idea, the message is this. This Christmas season, would you anticipate Jesus showing up? Would you anticipate Jesus showing up in your situation this season? One of the best things that, that I love about Christmas, the, the best part about Christmas is, is the kids, right? Can we all agree about that? It, it, it's seeing them just be so happy on Christmas morning with their present. It might not even be that significant. It might not cost that much money, but they open it up and they're just so excited. That's, that's the best part, right? See, kids, they don't, they don't get all the frustration. They don't get the stress. They don't get the anxiety that comes with Christmas. M- my daughter, she has no clue that on Christmas Eve, I'm going to be up at 11.30 or, or 1.30 in the morning putting together some type of present that's going to make me mad, make me say things I probably shouldn't under my breath. Like, they don't understand that frustration, but if you're a parent in here, you understand that frustration. You've lived that. You've probably lived that year after year. Like, they don't, they don't get it, right? They only have one thing on their to-do list, open presents, right? For a kid, Christmas is full of this. It's full of anticipation, it's full of joy, and it's full of excitement. You know what? I think they have it right. For us, Christmas should be this, full of anticipation, joy, and excitement to see and watch and experience how Jesus is going to show up in our lives. This season of the the church is called Advent, which comes from the word, eventually comes from the Greek word, parousia, which means coming. And it's a time where we remember how Jesus came and showed up in the past, how he will show up and come again in, in the future. But it's also a time where we reflect and think about how Jesus has showed up in our lives right now. And we look forward to Jesus showing up in our lives and our situation right now. This Christmas, would you anticipate him moving? Would you take a few things off that Christmas to-do list? Take off that pressure. You don't have to create that magical, perfect Christmas. Christmas is still going to happen. Kids are still going to be excited, even though if everything doesn't get done. But what's more important is that you look for Jesus to move. And you look for how he's moving in your situation. Recently, I've been doing um, a devotional, and one of the things in the devotional I ask every night, we do it in the evenings, and it asks you to reflect on this question. How have you seen, how have you experienced the goodness of God today? How have you experienced Jesus' love today? It's such a simple question, but for the past couple of months that I've done this devotional, it's been so rewarding for me just to sit and look back and think about the different moments in my day. I think about how Jesus showed up. Because if I don't take that time, if I don't have that margin, if my list is too big, I never get to look back and see how Jesus moved. My friends, if your list is too long, you won't either. Christmas will come and will go. And all the stress will stay, but there'll be no room for Jesus in your heart. No space for Jesus to show up because we're too busy. This Christmas, would you anticipate Jesus showing up? Would you pray with me? Father, you're good. And we thank you so much for this Christmas season. We thank you that you intervened in our world and that you show up. God, this Christmas is a reminder that that you see us, that you love us, and that you're willing to do something about our pain. You're willing to do something uh, about our our issues. And we thank you for the way that you showed up in the past. God, we we long for that when you will show up again in the future, but we are also looking forward with anticipation and excitement for how you will show up 
this Christmas season. Father, we love you. We praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen. amen.